The number one Texas Longhorns are heading to the Cotton Bowl to take on the number 18 Oklahoma Sooners. Why is the OU offense so bad? Why is the Venables defense finding success? Which players can really test the Longhorns? And most importantly, can a surging Texas team avoid the upset at the hands of our top rival? After the video, head over to Inside Texas to stay up to date on your favorite squad. I produce the new Inside Texas football YouTube channel too, and I'm live Monday through Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. Central, so come hang out. Inside Texas is the number one site for practice reports, accurate recruiting updates, and industry-leading game analysis. Subscribe to InsideTexas.com and the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel today. Links in the description. Texas hasn't been this highly rated coming into Red River in over 40 years, and the Oklahoma Sooners want nothing more than to wipe that smile off our face. This is the best rivalry game in the country, and it's time to see who leaves Dallas with the golden hat. The Texas Longhorns or the Oklahoma Sooners? Without further ado, let's get into it. Oklahoma's offensive coordinator took the Mississippi State gig and Venables promoted Seth Luttrell to lead the offense. And they've struggled to move the ball with any consistency. 117th in the country in yards per play and 127th in the nation in offensive success rate. They've scraped by with a 23rd ranked explosiveness, able to catch the sleeping defense a few times per game, and that's really the only reason they can put up any points. It's been a frustrating group to watch. The Oklahoma quarterback situation has been interesting to say the least. Five-star Jackson Arnold got benched and he deserved it. Worst yards per attempt in the SEC, only gaining 5.3 yards per throw. Sixth worst completion percentage at 59%, with several crucial interceptions and fumbles. Oklahoma made the right decision to bring in true freshman Michael Hawkins Jr., given the situation. Even with Hawkins' low sample size, they have improved in the key quarterback metrics. OU went from really bad to average. And that doesn't sound sexy, but that goes a long way in being able to win a few more games. Hawkins has posted a league average 8.4 yards per attempt and a slightly below average 62 completion percentage. With such little game time, we are lacking evidence on how dangerous he is in the deep game. He's only thrown a pass over 20 yards three times, and he did hit one of those. Due to him lacking true offensive command early in his career, those explosives a few times per game are going to prove crucial, like that fade ball in the Auburn game. And the good part about most deep shots is they're pre-snap or single read, so it doesn't require a lot of processing, so that'll help a younger Hawkins. Similar story for the intermediate passing. He doesn't meet the minimum snap requirements for a consistent grade, but if we do shoehorn in the eight attempts he does have, Hawkins does well here as the fourth graded intermediate thrower landing seven of eight of those attempts. When that middle of the field shot is open, he hits it. And keep an eye out for him on the late crosser on the opposite side of the field as well. What's odd is Hawkins' completion percentage on those throws under 10 yards is sketchy. On the quote-unquote easy throws, Hawkins is only completing 58%. For reference, half of the SEC is over 80% on these short throws. So he has to improve that quickly to make sure his offense can move effectively. Hawkins does hold the league's highest time to throw, so he needs to be able to identify and execute at a far quicker rate. But his receiver room is decimated by injury, and the remaining players aren't consistent in getting open. His youth and the lack of surrounding talent leads to an over-reliance on the scramble. He's only played one and a half games, and he's already seventh in the SEC for scramble attempts with 14. You can get him to drop those eyes easily. Twists and stunts by the defensive front will capture his attention and cause him to go into flight mode. That pressure can prove valuable beyond getting him to run. Hawkins' completion rate drops to 42% under pressure, which is league average, so he doesn't wilt under the heat, but it still shaves off enough effectiveness off his passing ability to alter the outcome. And since he's slower throwing the ball currently, he is sitting in the pocket too long, increasing the difficulty he faces. Hawkins leads the SEC in quarterback pressures allowed, with him being personally responsible for 33% of his own pressures, even though he does have a shaky offensive line. But even when it does get dicey, whether it's his fault, the receiver's fault, or the offensive line, he can make some of those wrongs right with his legs. Oklahoma will need those long runs and the ability to frustrate strong third down coverage to eke out wins this season. The kid's got heart too, but he simply has to limit the acrobatic hits he is taking or he's going to get injured. OU also needs to make sure he's developing as a passer and not too overly reliant on his athleticism as well. But the true superpower of Hawkins so far is simple. He's not turning the ball over. If he can just continue to not make the disaster play, then that gives Oklahoma a fighting chance. So Hawkins is definitely an upgrade from Jackson Arnold performance-wise, even with his limited starts. 
But truth is, it's tough to fairly evaluate him currently with the larger issues within the Oklahoma offense. The wide receiver room looks more like an emergency room. The offensive line has been in flux, and the young quarterback doesn't have a reliable run game to lean on. Plus, who knows if offensive coordinator Seth Luttrell will even be around next year. Besides the less-than-elite quarterback play this season, let's see why the Sooner offense has been so anemic through their first five games. First, let's look at that injury report in the receiving room. Intriguing young receiver Jaden Gibson blew out his knee in camp, and he won't be playing all season. Michigan transfer Andrell Anthony was a super-promising receiver for the Sooners last year until he went down with a knee injury versus Texas last season. He came back for a few snaps against Temple and went out again. He'll be out for Texas as well. Jaleel Farouk has also been a Sooner staple at wideout and a good one at that. He broke his foot and won't be playing. The 6'4", Nick Anderson, who caught the game winner last Red River, is dealing with a tweaked quad, and he's most likely out for a few games. And on top of that, Purdue transfer slot Deion Burks has also been nursing injury, but he actually is likely to make the return in Red River. That's five legit receiving talents that have gone down throughout the year. It's pretty nuts. But let's look at the remaining survivors. Assuming he can play, Deion Burks leads the team in targets with 36, pulling in 26 of those. He's a quick and compact 5'9", 194-pound slot with plenty of experience. Watch for Burks on the jet motions, reverses, typical behind-the-line slot speed stuff. But also keep watch over the middle for those quick RPO glances and the quick outbreakers in the red zone. He's fast, smart, and technical. Definitely the player you'll want to rely upon if you're a young quarterback. Overall, he's the 18th graded receiver out of 48 in the SEC. Second in targets with 23 is transfer tight end Bauer Sharp. He's been pretty reliable with a 78% catch rate, but not very productive with only 8.8 yards per reception. That ranks 12th of 14 SEC tight ends. OU utilizes him on the short concepts, so just be wary of him at the sticks or leaking out near the goal line. Overall, he's graded 6th of 14 receiving tight ends in the SEC. Just don't ask him to do any real tight end work like blocking. Third in targets is former Texas transfer Brennan Thompson. We know he's got incredible speed posting a 10-2-2-100 meter in high school. But all that speed doesn't mean much when that receiver-quarterback connection isn't solid with an awful 50% catch rate. He has an average depth of target but a bottom 10 yards per reception, so he's not landing those knockout blows. With electrifying speed that gives you pause as a defense, Thompson is still struggling to be impactful down to down, ranking 45th of 48 SEC receivers. Fourth in targets with only eight is Jacquez Petaway. The 5'10", 194-pound sophomore can move, and he's tough to keep up with on those crossers. He's got a third-ranked yards after catch per reception in the SEC, so either match up on him and man wisely or have a defender ready to hit him on the other end of those drag routes. He ranks 35th of 48 SEC receivers. And fifth in attempts with six is the big 6'4", 203-pound redshirt senior that OU fans have been waiting on to actually maximize his athletic gifts. J.J. Hester is certainly an impressive athlete able to mix that size and maneuverability, but can he be consistent? He certainly made a step in the right direction with three catches in that Auburn game, averaging 28 yards per reception, but right now he ranks 46th of 48 Southeastern receivers. A name to be aware of is converted cornerback Jacoby Johnson. The sophomore was moved over to the wide receiver room due to the injuries before the Auburn game. And he's got that right size at 6'2", 202 pounds with the receiver experience in high school. The athleticism is there, but can he truly learn the offense and be an actual threat in just three weeks? We're going to have to see. So it's a really low performing wide receiver room, but it would be intellectually dishonest to pretend like a bunch of third and fourth stringers are their true frontline talent. Reality is the bulk of their good receivers are stuck in the medical tent. And to add to the issues, the offensive line can't hold up against the pass rush. Oklahoma ranks 12th in the SEC in unit pass blocking efficiency, giving up 9 sacks, 10 quarterback hits, 28 hurries, for 40 total pressures on the season. They barely have one top half pass blocking offensive lineman, with center Branson Hickman at 42nd of 94 SEC pass blockers. Putting that all together, that's why this passing offense is 113th in the country in yards per pass. 124th in passing success rate, with a mid-tier 68th passing explosivity. But in the small sample size isolating only Hawkins' plays, the passing success rate would go from 124th in the country to 77th. So once again, going from awful to average. But the passing explosivity did skyrocket to 19th in the country. So Hawkins has been able to change the course of the passing offense so far, despite all the warts. 
So, wise and handsome Texas Homer, if Oklahoma can't pass, does that mean they are one-dimensional? No, because they also can't run. So this offense is no dimensional, a break in the space-time continuum. They are averaging just 3.1 yards per rush, ranked 94th in the nation, lacking consistency, ranking 123rd in rushing success rate, and relying entirely on the explosive run to gain their yards, with a good 10th-ranked rushing explosivity. But also their quarterbacks do a lot of the running as well. First in attempts with 57 is the 6-foot, 207-pound junior Javante Barnes, and he's having a rough season. Barnes has the second-to-last yards per attempt in the SEC with a bad 3.5. With a sketchy run-blocking line, you're going to need to be able to pick up dirty yards, and that's not occurring with a 22nd-ranked yards after contact per attempt. He's also not been able to reel off those long runs either, ranking 24th in breakaway percentage. Overall, Barnes is the 29th graded running back of 30 in the SEC. And these next two backs don't meet the minimum rushing attempts, but we are going to force them into the data set. Second with 18 attempts is the 5'11", 197-pound redshirt sophomore Gavin Sawchuk. He has a despicable 1.8 yards per carry, ranked dead last in the SEC by almost an entire yard. He also boasts the worst yards after contact per attempt in the conference and a bottom five breakaway percentage. Horrendous production or lack of production so far by Sawchuck, ranking dead last in the SEC overall. And third in attempts is the back that should likely be starting even though he's a true freshman. Taylor Tatum has been injured, but there's hope he'll be able to play in Red River. He's got good size at 5'10", 206 pounds for a youngster, but most importantly, he's got a ninth best yards per attempt at 6.4. And Tatum has shown intensity with a 10th ranked yards after contact per attempt, and he can capitalize in the open field with an 8th best breakaway percentage. His grade is bottom half of the league because he's getting dinged for a fumble, but it's a no-brainer that he should be the starting running back at OU currently. And of course, you're going to need the big boys up front, and OU is still working on finding that synergy with the mix of injuries and transfers within the room. For now, only two starters are top half run blockers and USC transfer left tackle Michael Tarquin at 14th and junior left guard Jacob Sexton at 41st. But undersized SMU transfer center Branson Hickman is a total liability in the run game, ranking dead last in the SEC. So do you go bare front and guarantee you get one-on-ones in the run game? The Oklahoma offense has been uncharacteristically dysfunctional this year, but with a new offensive coordinator, quarterback room shuffle, a non-experienced offensive line, injured receiving room, and lacking productive running back depth, what should we expect? Really, the offensive hope for Sooner fans right now is being placed in the hands of a true freshman quarterback, and he likely has a bright future, but can he play hero ball and win Red River in just his second start ever? That's the question that needs to be answered on Saturday. On the keys for the Texas defense, usually I start with coverage or run defense, but this matchup, it's about the pass rush. Texas just recently started landing those concrete sacks and a young Colin Simmons is emerging. This offensive line struggles to pass block and Hawkins can hold the ball for too long. Texas needs to be securing those sacks to get Hawkins and company far behind the sticks and desperate. But don't overrun him or leave your pass rushing lanes or Hawkins can and will go for big yards. Use all sorts of twists, stunts, or blitzes to get him to drop his eyes and try to freelance opposed to running the offense. The Texas passing defense is number one in the nation in opponent pass yards per attempt, only giving up four and a half yards per pass. That's an elite number. Teams can't move the ball consistently with the 11th ranked defensive passing success rate or sneak those deep shots ranked 16th in opponent passing explosivity. We've been locking it down. The coverage should be able to blanket this receiving core since it's not their ideal starters for the most part. The receivers don't get consistent separation and the concepts aren't very innovative. But you know OU is going to break out some concepts we've never seen before on tape. So it is time to stress test our statistically dominant pass defense. We did let Mississippi State get behind us a few too many times. It's important to see how improved these Texas DBs are from last year. The OU run game is also struggling without a lot of options. Texas did give up 150 yards to the Bulldogs last game, but that was just due to their running volume. Texas is the 13th ranked rushing defense in yards per carry, only giving up 3.2 yards per run. It's hard for teams to find consistent success as well, with a 36th ranked defensive rushing success rate. And we do take away the long run too, ranked 16th in defensive rushing explosivity. So does OU see Levy's game plan from Mississippi State and try to shorten the clock and possess the ball on the ground? I don't really know. 
And you'll hear the national media in this matchup talk about the elite OU defense. The reality is the Texas defense is better. They're currently ranked fourth in the country in DFEI. But I do know it's clearly not the Riley era anymore in Norman, and the offense hasn't been pulling their weight. And maybe that can change with Michael Hawkins. But for now, it's the other side of the ball that's winning Oklahoma games. But before we hit the defense, the sponsor of today's video is Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a skill based daily fantasy sports app where you can make college football player projections all season long. How does it work? You select two to six players and choose more or less on their prize pick projections. It could be passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, and more. And if those players score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 100 times your money this football season. I do a lot of Texas and opponent research, so I like to put my insights to the test and prize picks is a fun way for me to put my money where my mouth is. Just hop on the prize picks app or website, go to the college football tab and check out the player projections. It's a smooth process where you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less with fast withdrawals. It's that easy. As a first time depositor, use promo code TexasHomer and get $50 instantly once you play $5 in lineups. You don't need to win your lineup to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. So sign up for prize picks, use promo code TexasHomer at sign up and add even more excitement to your game day. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Link in the description. The Oklahoma defense is a fun group to watch. Philosophically, it's an aggressive defense that likes to send unique pressures, attack offensive line protections, and then play with your head by disguising coverages and simulating those very same pressures later on. A Venable's defense isn't reactive. It's often dictating where the quarterback passes and where the opposing team can run. You have to take the lead against this team and punch first or you'll be off balance. And it starts with their ability to stop the run. The Sooners have a great rushing defense, ranking 8th in the nation in opponent yards per run with a staunch 2.6 yards per carry. They are obsessed with the line of scrimmage and you see guys creeping towards it all the time. There's a clear directive from up top to not let teams get going on the ground. Oklahoma doesn't have elite interior run stopping, but they have several guys that set a high floor. Grayson Halton ranks 22nd. TCU transfer nose Dominic Williams is 23rd. Rotational nose DeJon Terry is 25th and freshman defensive tackle Jaden Jackson is 27th. Not elite, but everyone is serviceable with no glaring weaknesses here. On the edge, starting end Ethan Downs is the best run stopper ranked 14th, with Trace Ford barely making the top half at 29th. Texas does need to run at 47th ranked Caden Woolard and 60th ranked R. Mason Thomas when they are on the field. Finally, you arrive at the pride of the defense, the second level. Rotational linebacker Samuel Omasigo is the highest graded run stopper. He's even got some reps at their hybrid nickel cheetah position. He's got good size at 6'2", 230, and he's down to hit. The trade-off is he struggles to cover in the pass game, though. He ranks 19th of 52 SEC run stopping linebackers. Mike Danny Stutzman is the real deal, leading the SEC in tackles and run stops. He's just an awesome player. Incredibly aggressive, fires downhill, and does all that while generally playing within the scheme. Stutzman's play style gives the whole defense their edge. He's graded the 21st of 53 run-stopping linebackers, but I'm personally overriding that grade. He's better than that. Starting Will Kip Lewis has a long way to go, though, graded last as the 53rd SEC linebacker against the run. He leads the league in missed tackles, whiffing a little over a quarter of the time. Good athlete, he just needs to learn to play under control. The secondary has a few top half-run defenders. Safety Robert Spears Jennings is the top secondary defender, ranked 5th. Sheeta Kendall Dolby was at 15th, but he went down for the season. Rotational corner, sometimes nickel now, Woody Washington ranks 28th. And strong safety Billy Bowman ranks 50th of 110 secondary run stoppers. But starting free safety Peyton Bowen, starting corners Kanai Walker and Des Malone aren't productive in the run game currently. The OU rushing defense is their anchor and where they can drive teams into passing downs. Once you're in those passing downs, they can lean on another defensive strength, the pass rush. OU has both the personnel and the aggressive scheme, ranking fourth in the country in sacks, averaging a little over three per game. On the interior, only Grayson Halton is a top 10 pass rusher with one sack, one quarterback hit, and eight hurries. But Oklahoma has two of the top 10 pass rushers in the league out on the edge. Trace Ford ranks fourth with two sacks and two hurries. And R. Mason Thomas ranks eighth, and he's tied for first in the SEC with six sacks. And he also boasts one quarterback hit and six hurries. These two are a problem, especially when they're both on the field. What's most interesting is if you filter for true pass sets, eliminating all the quick throws and play action stuff, 
Our Mason Thomas is the best graded pass rusher, and Trace Ford is right behind him at number two. You do not want to end up in too many second and third and longs against Oklahoma. If we continue to look at those true pass sets, the linebacker room makes noise as well, with starting Mike Danny Stutzman ranked second in the SEC, and starting Will Kip Lewis ranked eighth of 26 pass rushing SEC linebackers. Neither have a sack, but boy do they freak out quarterbacks and force the ball out quickly. Also, with both linebackers able to blitz effectively, you struggle to know are both coming, just one, neither, they can generate some paranoia. And in the secondary safety, Robert Spears Jennings has to be accounted for. He only has seven pass rushes, but two of those were sacks and one was a hurry. So he's been excellent at generating pressure when they do send him. They will overload a side of the line and give him a free run or an easy matchup. Be wary of Spears Jennings creeping around the line or being suspiciously too close to the box. He's the third graded secondary pass rusher in the Southeastern. So you think having a top performing run defense, forcing teams into passing situations, and having an awesome pass rush where you can sack guys, you would be doing the secondary a big favor, and the Oklahoma pass coverage would also be dominant. But it's not. And that's why I can't go with the OU defense as elite narrative. OU is 83rd in the nation in opponent yards per pass on defense, giving up 7.9 yards per throw. They're 93rd in passing success rate, allowing teams to nickel and dime them, and they do give up the bomb on top of that ranking 74th in defensive passing explosivity. That aggression the defense displays leaves their secondary vulnerable in man coverage, and teams have been able to exploit that. This secondary has a lot of name recognition, but right now it's based on hype and not supported by the numbers. First, let's do a quick detour at the linebackers. Will Kip Lewis is killing it in coverage, ranked as the top coverage linebacker in the SEC, and he won the Auburn game on that pick six for them. But Mike Danny Stutzman does struggle in space, ranked 38th of 51 linebackers against the pass. Their best safety is actually the least known. Robert Spears Jennings is ranked 4th, and this dude is somehow slept on right now, but he can ball. Then a big drop to corner Des Malone at 35th, and other starting corner Kenai Walker squeaks by in the top half at 55th. But both of these corners will be tested. Malone gave up a deep strike versus Auburn, and frankly, Kenai Walker is too bulky to run with fast guys downfield. Good news for OU is Desan McCullough is finally back from injury, and at 6'5", 235 pounds, he could be at that cheetah spot. We just need to see how they deploy him and also how rusty is he. He was the best secondary coverage defender in the Big 12 last year, even at that big size. Also, you're going to want to keep an eye on true freshman Eli Bowen to get a bigger role in the corner rotation or possibly even start to add some more coverage ability. He spoke to the media the other day, and that's not something freshmen with small roles get to do, so watch out for him. The remaining coverage guys aren't doing so hot. Safety Bowen is ranked 82nd. Strong safety Billy Bowman is ranked 93rd. And rotational corner Woody Washington is the lowest graded coverage DB in the entire SEC at 112th. But due to Venable's ability to force quarterbacks to throw into bad situations, that unit does have a respectable 36th ranked interceptions per game. So just avoid the occasional pick. So you can see this is a really, really good OU defense, especially against the run or in the pass rush, but it's not elite when you're that easily exploited through the air. What makes them appear so dominant is Venable's knack for generating turnovers. They're currently fifth in the country in turnover margin, and that would be first in the country if Jackson Arnold didn't have so many dumb turnovers early in the season. You have to be hyper aware of holding onto the ball as a quarterback facing the pass rush, a running back struggling for extra yards, or a receiver tipping the ball to the secondary. You beat OU by taking care of the football. Overall, the Sooners are the 10th ranked defense in the advanced metric, DFEI. The keys for the Texas offense is to not stall out in the run game. Texas does have a decent rushing attack, good for 34th in the country in yards per rush and 21st in rushing consistency. We just lack the explosive play at 103rd in the country in rushing explosivity. Oklahoma's run defense has been their bread and butter. Find ways to move the ball on the ground and don't let Oklahoma run blitz you into constantly being behind the sticks because then you're vulnerable to a really strong pass rush. And no doubt you don't want to constantly face this group of edges, but Texas has the first ranked pass blocking offensive line in the country, only giving up one sack four quarterback hits, and eight QB hurries all season for just 13 total pressures in five games. So even though OU can absolutely rush the passer, they face the best in the nation in making sure that doesn't happen. By now we've seen OU's defensive weakness is their coverage. Texas's offensive strength is the pass, so this is a mismatch for Oklahoma. 
Texas ranks ninth in the country in yards per pass, averaging 10 yards a throw. That's a first down every pass. It's not a streaky group either with the 8th best passing success rate, and we can land the knockout shot with the 24th ranked passing explosivity. On top of that, Quinn Ewers is returning. Texas can also convert those 3rd and longs as well, ranking 7th and 3rd down conversions in the country. Overall, this Texas team is the 5th ranked offense in the country versus the 10th ranked Oklahoma Sooner defense. It should be fireworks. On paper, Texas has a large advantage due to their effective defense against a struggling Sooner offense and Texas having a big passing advantage versus the Sooner defense. Vegas has Texas as a 14-point favorite currently, but this matchup is always a weird one as deception and emotions play a huge role here. Oklahoma has something to prove in year three of Venables to display they can hang with the SEC, and Texas is trying to show the nation that number one ranking is correct. After all the smoke has settled, who leaves Dallas with the golden hat? We'll see this Saturday afternoon at the Cotton Bowl. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, hook on.